Wow. By the way, my understanding is the cake has to go very quickly at the end of this. I appreciate my grad students for making that. And I also wanted to start out by thanking Al. Al has worked for the college for many years and now the provost's office, making it possible for us to do what we do. So I appreciate your service in that way as well. All right, we're going to talk about stormwater. I usually find that even if in the College of Engineering, people kind of look at this area and scratch their head a little bit. So we're going to talk a little bit about what, why we're doing this type of research, what it means, and some examples of what we've been doing. I promise for all the people who are not stormwater nerds, there's not a lot of equations and, and only a couple graphs along the way. We are engineers after all. But I wanted to get through this a little bit. Uh, first of all, this is a very interdisciplinary area. And I also want to thank all the people that I work with on a daily basis, who a lot of the work is from them. Uh, not to mention the grad students in the back, which I'll save to the very end a little bit about this. Drs. Andrea Welker, Dr. Bridget Wadzuck, Dr. John Komlos, and more recently, Dr. Garrett Clayton from Mechanical Engineering are working this area. It's a very multidisciplinary area. And by saying that, we also can get into the social sciences, the economy, the business models, all come into play in this work, which makes it a very fascinating area. But anyway, the water management challenges are very simple. We either got too much water, too little water, it's in the wrong place, it's in the wrong time. We interrupt it with our building processes, we pollute it, and now, of course, the rain's changing. So all these are, from an engineering standpoint, are, uh, make the area very complicated. And we'll get into that as we go along a little bit. The very fundamental problem is what we do with the environment. And I am assuming all of you have a roof over your head, to include myself. So I guess in some ways we're all sinners in this and we're all creating the problems that we're trying to address. On a natural cycle, we probably get about 40 to 45 inches a year at Philadelphia in this region of rain. All right. On a natural environment, four or five inches of that would go into the river system as surface flow. The rest of it evaporates, goes back into the atmosphere, some soaks into the soil, comes back and it evapotranspirates through the plants. Some of it, not that much, believe it or not, soaks into the deep groundwater, and some of it en enters the stream a couple days later for the base flow of the water in the stream when it's not raining. When we build in an environment and change the land shape, what we do is we greatly accelerate that water and change it from four or five inches from reaching in the stream to 30, 25 to 35 inches reaching the stream a year. And that has a tremendous impact on our systems. So the consequences is increased flooding. A lot of areas around here, you can see this, the Darby area, Darby Creek, from all the development, a lot more water goes into that and increases flooding. We have the eroding rivers, uh, Valley Forge, go out and visit that sometime. You'll see tremendous examples of that. And of course, polluted waters as well. All the brake linings, the nutrients from the fertilizers, the hydrocarbons all get washed into the system to include temperature, which is also a pollutant coming off uh, these rivers. And the impact is very real. There's drinking water costs, wastewater treatment costs, there's property loss. This poor engineer is trying to figure out how to save that road from being eroded away, so there's a, a cost to the communities. Uh, access to the natural. Uh, environment in the Philadelphia. You can't go sculling in some days when the water pollution levels from the rainfall come down in, those, in the Schuylkill. And of course, unfortunately, fatalities. So there it's a very real cost and it's been a highly regulated area for many, many years uh, when we start looking at the stormwater aspects. In some areas, it's a little different. Philadelphia, I'm not sure when this Courier and Eyes print is from, but yeah, I love the steamships. It's been a big city for a long time. Now imagine all those homes with an outhouse behind each one. Probably not the cleanest city back then. And so what happened was the city bricked over all the streams going through the city and moved the waste and the stormwater back in the same facility. This was done for public health. And it's not just Philadelphia. There's hundreds and hundreds of cities in the United States, Europe, Paris, uh, Quebec, uh, that have this same type of an issue. So what happens and is that when you have a little rain, all that 
stuff, using the engineering term here, ends up in the sewage treatment plant. When you have a little more rain, no. It bypasses, it goes into the rivers. So in some areas, you got a quarter inch or a half inch of rain, we have raw sewage going into the Schuylkill and the Delaware rivers. And so this is an issue that people are trying to address, along with the other issues that we talked about. So whether we're in the urban areas and the suburban areas, it's a very similar type of a problem. And one great example, I think, is this slide that shows the historic streams of Philadelphia. Uh, there is a race street, right? There was a mill race there at one particular point, no, no, long, no longer. You can see in the middle slide where the streams have disappeared and in the right where they've reappeared as interceptor sewers. So this is part of the issues in the stormwater, whether you're the urban area or the rural area. And this is a very international problem, whether I'm talking about Panama City, Beijing, Paris, all over the world, we're all working on this particular area. And one of the things that's happened is a very su good success story for all the water quality people is that we spent a lot of time working on reducing the point source. <laughs> so this little plot from uh, last year, you can see that basically the point sources, the wastewater treatment plants, the industrial sources, the pollutant levels have dropped precipitously, where now most of our pollutant is actually the runoff from the streets and the roads and the buildings. It's no longer coming from all these point sources anymore. And it's been regulated for a while, but only recently have they sti really started looking at new approaches in dealing with this. And one of these approaches we call green infrastructure. And basically what green infrastructure is, is we're trying to restore some of the natural hydrologic balance in the urban environment. Um, and a, a little bit more about that. If I talk about stormwater management, we're trying to talk about the mitigating the effects of urbanization. If I'm talking about green infrastructure, we're trying to use natural systems to do that work. And that's only been around about 15 years. It's a fairly new area, which is very exciting in engineering because usually people have been studying an area for hundreds of years. And this area has not been that long, which makes it a very exciting area to work in. So, luckily, this is real simple, right? I'm looking at my grad students in the back and the undergraduates here who haven't had uh, Mechanics 3 yet. We have four things we can do. We can, well, actually, it should be fifth. The fifth is we don't build in a certain location. All right. We can infiltrate the water into the ground. We can evapotranspirate it or use the plants to remove that water and put it back to the atmosphere. We can delay it so it takes a long time to move through the system or we can reuse it. That is all that we can do in these projects. Uh, sounds very nice and very simple. If you think of another one, you'll be rich and famous. So that would be good for the entrepreneurship uh, programs as we move along. The challenges of doing this is immense. In the urban area, a lot of it is trash removal. It's space. Where do you find space for looking at green infrastructure? It's the maintenance. It's the costs. It's the social acceptance. Um, and taking advantage of other parameters of benefits, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, it's the understanding from the engineering aspect of these systems. Those are a lot of the challenges that we're dealing with. Um, and one thing I want you to understand, one of the big precepts of all this, is that most rains comes in smaller levels. Doesn't sound like a very big concept, but this is a new concept. Uh, when some members of the audience who I know and did projects several years back, uh, we only worried about hurricanes. Well, the problem is most of the rain falls in smaller storms. So in Philadelphia, if I just grab an inch, we're probably talking about 80% of the rain falls in storms less than that. If I grab an inch for the bigger storms and all the smaller storms, I'm up to about 90%. So what is advantage of this system is really looking at what it can do for really tackling these day-to-day -day storms and not necessarily the big hurricanes. So obviously from what Al was saying, you know I have a, after looking at the devastation in New Orleans after Hurricane <laughs> Katrina, that area is also obviously very important as well. So uh, very luckily, uh, very early, we were able to convince facilities and the college and the university to allow us to do experimentations on the Villanova campus. No, very few universities have done this, though a few are trying to copy us now, but they're, they come to us for help. We, we, we're nice people, so we help them. 
But basically, uh, we have used this campus as a demonstration. So a little example would be on the Sear building, the green roof that is there. I don't know how many of you know between Mendel and, not Mendel, between uh, right in front of the business school here, you can see these uh, brick pavers are porous pavers, and there's very large rock beds for soaking water underneath. It's been a study going along for about 12 or 14 years. In the Mendel, the parking lot, porous asphalt and porous concrete. Infiltration trench, which has just been reborn uh, with Dr. Kamlos and the very new parking garage additions. Uh, we have a one acre stormwater wetlands on campus between the law school and the facilities. Uh, treatment trains, uh, rain gardens, and all sorts of stuff which we'll talk about, about later. And this is only a few of what is on the campus that we've been dealing with. Um, and I just wanted to walk through a couple simple, to talk, couple projects very simply, to talk about what we're learning from them, how they all kind of fit together. Uh, on West Campus, between the soccer field, field hockey field and some of the basketball, uh, sand, is it still sand basketball courts there, I believe? There is a rain garden we built 15 years ago. It's one of the first ones that have been built and studied in the nation. And we've been studying this for quite a while. And it's a fairly simple structure. You dig out the soil, get the hydraulics of the water to actually go in, replace the soil with a sandier soil, and plant it, and let the water soak in during a storm event. Sounds pretty simple. We're still working on it 15 years later, learning about the hydrologic, the geotechnical, the biological, the water quality, and all the aspects of these particular sites. So just a little example here. So this amount of pavement moves in. And so this was designed to capture about an inch of runoff from all these sites and soak it into the ground. Um, we did this before the regulatory structure was in place. So we violate a lot of the current methodologies, but we built it before they had it. And it's working better than the current methodology. Sorry, Daniel. So bust on a former student who works for DEP in the audience here. Um, building it back in 2001, very simple, <laughs> dug it out, mixed it up with sandy soil to promote the infiltration, put it back in, planted it, and it's amazing. I think we have more money in instrumentations than it costs to build the particular project. Uh, so we're interested in things like the water quality as it's moving through, the amount of water, where it's going, that type of aspects. Um, we break up the sites into different components. So we have a surface storage, we have a root zone and media storage, and the reason why we have to pay attention to the root zone, because the plants can remove a lot of water. So we have to go back and look, talk to all these horticulturalists and tell us about you know, how these plants are operating and the roots of their systems and the native soils. Why this is important is because, of course, as a design engineer, when they're building something in Villanova, we have to meet the current legal requirements, so they have to predict the performance of some of these sites. So that's what we're, one of the reasons why we're working on this. We can look over many years of data, the infiltration of the water moving into the soil. And don't worry, not a lot of plots or numbers, I promise. But here's one that's kind of interesting. Very early on, we're able to take a look at this site and say a half inch of rain, we've never had any overflow from this basin. And a half inch of rain, that is kind of what the bowl is designed for. I have another half inch of rain, we very rarely have it any water overflowing these systems because that is what the soil is designed for. That doesn't sound like very complex, but this is very good information, important information at the time. Because everybody was worried about the water cycle. What happens if you have rain two days in a row? We're able to answer a lot of these questions and get rid of myths this way. And also the fact that this little site designed for very small amounts of rain is also surprisingly effective for the bigger storms, which is fairly new and still not within the engineering design fields as well. So we've involved and looked past that and looked for an example. And again, my last grant, and I have a few from Dr. Wozniak, sorry about that. But I have just look at, look at inflow and outflow. I'll just make it simple. All these sites, all these storms did much better than the design. So it's not often in engineering where you have a project that does better than your design parameters. So one of our current work is trying to figure out why and see if we can use that information to improve the efficiency and operation of these particular sites. Um, it can get very complex. Here is a little flow chart kind of 
that one of our, uh, our postdocs, Dr. Ryan Lee, put together in trying to look at the numerical model for understanding this. We have a surface water, we have a soil void space, a Vado zone movement, we have the root systems moving the water up and going down. Some places like to book rock beds to expand the operations. We have infiltration off the sides. How do I put this into a model, and that has still not been completely done, to really understand and categorize all this? Because once we can do that, then we can give it to the engineering profession, and you can improve your designs and maybe reduce some costs. So hopefully that'll be next week we'll have that done. And, this, um, and then the fact, we have the variabilities of the weather. What do I design this for? Do I do the drizzles, the light rains, the moderate rains, the heavy rains, snow? What are the design characteristics? Because it's not just an individual storm, you're talking about what happens daily. And I can move in and also facilities, we still haven't figured this out, facilities likes to put a lot of snow on these sites, so I have no idea how to do conservation of mass when we have snow plows throwing all the snows on the sites. So it's a very, very complex problem from an engineering standpoint, which is why we have such a team working on the projects. And then once we have that in depth, we could start comparing it to other projects for getting an idea. Uh, Jerry, I think your name is on there in the back here. This Dr. Wadzik is now the PI of this little green roof. But this, this green roof is very effective at removing water. It can hold about a quarter to a half inch, is that about right, I think, of rain of water in this media. And the idea is then it evapotranspirated back up to the atmosphere. And so this is, again, Villanova probably doesn't need to do a lot of these because we have a lot of green space. We can build rain gardens instead. But for an urban environment, this is a tremendous site. And Dr. Wadzik's been doing a lot of work on this particular site. And um, guess what the biggest problems on a green roof is for efficiency? What's that? Like access? No, you put a lock on it, so I can't get to it anymore without a cue. Thank you. We've had a little uh, disagreement on access and availability to get on a green roof. Watering, uh, the watering the plants. Well, actually, that's part of it. It's the other way. We don't get enough water. So when it rains, this works for a day or two. And the plants are designed, uh, Dr. Watson calls them nature's cockroaches. They'll live through anything. Uh, so basically, the problem is that we have many, many periods where this is not performing because there's no rain. So it works for a day or two after the storm event, then it's just sitting there. So Dr. Wadzik has a National Science Foundation grant. Oh, just to show you the efficiencies, in 2013, this little roof designed for this little bit of water got rid of over two-thirds of the water from the system for evapotranspiration. That's an amazing performance for such a small storage area. But now, we have looked at it, and for an NSF project, we have a roof next to it that is not evapotranspirating. So we put some holes in some pipes and putting in a tank, or Dr. and Dr. Wadzik and Jerry Zaremba are looking at how to capture the overflow and then use this to water the green roof between storm events to double the performance. So a very interesting project, and we're doing that some other places at the university as well. Uh, we have other projects looking at trying to measure the evapotranspiration and the, and the infiltration of the systems. Uh, Amanda Hess is working on this and the other names uh, for many years, but you can see we've built some experimental sites. One thing we've learned is nobody buy, makes stuff for us to do this. We have to invent every one of our experiments, uh, which gets very interesting. We found out that the bowl underneath of each one of these for doing the measurements was perfect for a beer distiller, a uh, beer uh, cr craft system. So some of my purchases, I think, purchasing shakes their head when they see what I'm trying to buy. <laughs> I'm now on the distribution list monthly for uh, beer making uh, devices, but it worked out perfectly for our experiments. And again, what we've learned a lot about is the relationship between the water and the plants and the evapotranspiration. And you can see some of the dates of these studies are just coming out uh, from our different groups along the way. We're looking at different soils and evapotranspiration and how to pick different soils for different soil conditions. If I'm in an area with limestone, I may not want to infiltrate a lot of water. So I want to might build my system to evapotranspirate more than infiltrate. To do that, you have to make sure the plants are happy. So it's a very inter interdisciplinary area and we're 
It's amazing the, the stuff that's being pumped out right now in, uh, in publications. Uh, one of our more, and how this kind of comes together and builds, uh, right off the parking garage by the St. Augustine Center, you might have seen this long line of plants. This was built a couple, it's been on kind of hidden during the construction of the new parking garage, but it'll be expanded back out again. But we tr wanted to do a treatment train. And so the idea was we built runoff from the roof, going into a vegetated swale, going into two little rain gardens, and then into an infiltration trench. And this little project was designed for around about an inch of runoff coming off this parking garage. During Hurricane Sandy, or Superstorm Sandy, it got rid of 400 percent, approximately, more water than it was designed to do. So then this is giving us other ideas for more investigations to see how all these parts fit together, which I'm not going to get into right now. Uh, but it's, uh, it's an expanded because now we're going to be starting doing work with Pennsylvania Department of Transportation and AECOM on a project in Philadelphia. We're working with Philadelphia Water Department on applied research on how to advance their systems. Um, just a, another look, besides all the vegetated systems, we do have some uh, pervious systems. This is again between Sheehan and Sullivan. You can see the rock beds being placed underneath the concrete at the time, and these strips along the edges were porous for the water to soak in. It's one of the early insulations, and that concrete didn't do very well for those that remember this particular site. Father Peter, but it did very well hydrologically. So most of the water that fell on that site, that fell on Sheehan and Sullivan, was soaked in the ground. Uh, no water quality problems, tremendous results. So much so we quit studying it, but it's there just in case we want to come back. And now if I take a look, this area of the pavers is porous, where water is, goes right through those pavers into that very uh, rock bed. Uh, and we also have, just to show you the advantage of the campus, we have a constructed stormwater wetland that's under study. And uh, this was our first project that I built. I'm not going to pretend when it was. Uh, actually, no, the second project, Dr. Weeder and I worked on one actually before this. But we got tremendous amounts of removals and <laughs> pollutants from this site. It's kind of interesting. The neighbors actually, it's one of the few projects I think We've gotten nice letters from the neighbors at Villanova, how much they like this particular site, so much that when we we're rebuilding it, they reported us the DEP for destroying it because they thought we were building a building. <laughs> when we're just, we're, we're working on a grant trying to rebuild and make this a more uh, better amenity for water quality. So, as I said, we moved into Philadelphia and it's a different story. I like to use the talk about the country mouse and the city mouse, if you remember that as a kid. But uh, the city mouse is very, very different. You have a lot of problems with size, locations, where you can put things. We're looking at several different projects in the city of Philadelphia. One I really love is the zoo parking garage, our parking lot. This is the giraffe parking lot. And you notice <coughs> our inventive students decided we had to have a, a giraffe neck over instrument bowl for the weather patterns. So we are doing work now at the city of Philadelphia. They also hire a lot of graduates. And their concept is they are required by EPA to mitigate all these overflows from the combined sewers. All right. Because of that, that requires them to either A, build gigantic tunnels to store the water like other cities have done. Instead, they've decided to spend those billions of dollars in greening the city to reduce the water before it even gets in those pipes. And it's being used as an example all over the world right now. I don't know. How many groups from China and from other cities around the United States have come to look at what Philadelphia is doing? So here's the idea, because I said it's hard to find spots in the city, have a little area, they want to bump it out and build in uh, areas to capture the water, infiltrate, evapotranspirate it. At the same time, there's other benefits. There's the benefits of a heat island effect, reducing the heat in the city, better air quality. Uh, there's been studies from social scientists, and I have no idea if you're in here, how you do this about looking at drug arrests, school scores, and areas that have done this. So there's a lot of potential for increasing this work past just the College of Engineering uh, as we move forward. Um, and here's what their artist's rendition of what they want the city to look like in about 40 or 50 years, which would be pretty exciting if they can get to that. But there are massive problems, the maintenance problems, 
the people's attitudes, uh, and that's why we're working with them right now. Uh, Dr. Ali Ibrahimian is heading up this project. We're looking about trying to, from an engineering standpoint, how to build these things smarter so they can be more effective and, and uh, be more cost effective. And one of the things I wanted to end with, I was, um, wanted to talk about this type of project in a university like Villanova. It, it's not just the research, it's the benefits to the students. We have higher undergraduates for working in our labs. We have service projects in different countries. Uh, one of my PhD students here is talking to a freshman class in engineering about the green roof. Uh, this was a nice Christmas pit card I got for my grad students. <laughs> so you can see we got a whole bunch that are being supported. Uh, this is down in Panama City on a project we were doing as a capstone senior uh, project of some of our students down there a year ago. And they all were texting me about supporting Villanova basketball <laughs> during the games. Uh, we also would have the service of St. Thomas of Villanova Day. We do a lot of service with the profession. Uh, we do a lot of tours on campus. Here's a few rain gardens we've built, a lot of STEM activities. Megan, I'm glad you're so serious in the <laughs> STEM activities pictures. But these are working in Roosevelt. This is a wind anemometer built out of Dixie cups. Uh, and uh, some of the people are not here today because they are actually working on a STEM project there. I was told one of our chief lessons we've learned is kids work for Skittles. <laughs> um, and one of our new exciting parking projects, besides PennDOT, besides Andrea Welka's work of the region, the Went William Penn Foundation, is we're very excited about this. Not this, we're excited about that going away. Currently, this was built before there was any stormwater regulations. So where you have, instead of four and a half inches of water going downstream, you have about 40 inch, 45 inches a year going downstream. This is being rebuilt, and with the dorm complex, there's going to be a lot of green infrastructure, and they're going to be reusing the water off the roofs for the air conditioning and heating system. So as a result of this, instead of all the water running off the site, only water from rainstorms greater than two inches should be running off the site. And we've already got a grant to start, got the paperwork yesterday, to start instrumenting the before condition of this main lot. So we're looking at this as going to be a national site, if not international, to show what can be done with the green infrastructure. And there's, we've got to get a better picture of that uh, from, the, from the Villanova website of what that site is going to be looking like. And we also have to acknowledge we have a lot of firms involvement with us, including a couple that are here today. We appreciate their work with us uh, in, 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 in supporting this work and all the grad students. <laughs> I took Friday off. <laughs> <laughs> so that note, I uh, know I rushed through that a little bit. I apologize. Uh, but I would be glad to answer any questions if they're there. <laughs> oh. Good class, you need at least three good questions, right? <laughs> yes? So there's a lot of interest in putting gardens in urban areas and actually providing food for urban areas. How would the gardens stack up in a rain garden? Um, I think that would be better as a water reuse system than a rain garden, just because the plants have to live in that environment. There's a great example in Philadelphia. We should work out a class trip for one of these. There is a Superfund site where they've concreted over the land. It's near Fishtown. And what they've done is they built a nursery there. They capture water off all the, the concrete areas. They use it to water and grow the plants. And from a sustainability perspective, they supply a lot of the restaurants in Philadelphia. So when they go and take the, the vegetables to all the restaurants, they collect the waste oil and use it to create biofuel. So it's a very interesting. It's been, uh, been on quite a few different publications. So it is definitely, if you can capture the water and use it, and hopefully capture it off a tall building so you have the energy <coughs> for distributing it, that would work very well. Unfortunately, in a rain garden, it's either going to be very dry or very wet. So it may not be the greatest place for growing. Maybe uh, when we get the green roof and a regular watering cycle, that would be different. We can get some stuff for the holy grounds down below. <laughs> yes?
yeah, that has to be part of the design. We do need those structural engineers for something. But it, I mean, basically it's, uh, <laughs> it would be, uh, you, you basically do have to account for the water. So you would have to figure out, you have the soil load, and the soil is usually, I mean, if it's, there's two types of green roofs. Some up in New York City, uh, the Rockefeller Center, they're designed, they're like two feet of soil so they could plant trees. Most green roofs are more like three or four inches. So you have to do the three or four inches of the soil and you would have to figure out the, the force of the water. I mean the weight of the water as well. So it's a very easy calculation, it's a very standard calculation that can be done. I know Swarthmore built a lot of green roofs on their dorms and they said the only thing they really had to do was maybe plussed up a few of the beams. So it's uh, with the snow load and all those aspects. Some of the older structures from the 40s and 30s are so strong, you, we can, you, they're very easy retrofits. More newer structures are harder to retrofit unless you go through and check the calculations. Good question. So, yes, sir. It was not easy. I mean, well, first of all, the EPA told them you have to do something or you're going to be fined. But to be honest with you, the water direct, the was water commissioner later, but earlier is Howard Newcraig, who just retired, who basically spearheaded this effort. And they did four or five years of research and sampling and studies. They did economic studies looking at the cost of the different areas. They are also redoing some of the gray infrastructure, but most of the money is going to the green. And it's part of their permit with the US EPA. Uh, they did a lot of public outreach, and they still do a lot of public outreach. They had uh, Mayor Nutter out doing water balloon tosses on a forest street alley near South Philly. So it's, I mean, I also saw some very nasty propaganda about what they were doing also from some other sides. But it's very nice to be from a region that is a leader in this area. And the nice thing is the head of the program right now is a Villanova graduate. Uh, Mark Camerata, uh, from class, not gonna, don't know how far back I can get, 98 or something like that, who's the head of that program right now. And uh, we have a lot of, they hire, they looked at our research and they reached out to us and they hire a lot of our graduates. So it's a very, uh, it's a very nice relationship, especially what they're very interested in taking what we've learned and putting it in the ground. So it's like the, Villanova is a great field experimental station. If we can add the whole of the city of Philadelphia, I mean, you can't get better than that. Yes? How about the Navy Yard? Where is that going? That is there not in the combined sewer area. Not. It is not. They have some green infrastructure there, but the main focus of the city is in the combined sewer area for now. But uh, that is an opportunity area, yes. In fact, Urban Outfitters had floating wetlands in one of the docks, which is also under study for water quality aspects. Yes? Yes, well actually it's what it's related to is the fecal coliforms being washed out is one of the water qualities. It should improve it. Um, one of the interesting things about climate change is we expect a few larger storm events every year. Since we don't have storm events every day, we have a feeling these are going to work very well and we're, we have a, some people looking at the effects of climate change, what we have to do now to address that in the future as it changes. Yes, Daniel. Yes, uh, uh, I know you're on our advisory board, uh, but uh, you got a lot of industrial standards around there. But my question is, what are you doing to incorporate the results of the new research to be adopted by the University of North Carolina that you apply and how it works? That's a very good question. Um, <laughs> The standards in Pennsylvania and the nation are about 10 to 15 years old. And frankly, they were built based on we didn't know exactly how things were operating. We still don't know completely, but we know a lot better now. Unfortunately, the process of updating uh, regulatory issue uh, is not in my purview. I do all I can and tell the people that they need to update it. We do publications which these updates should be part of. But that is one of the hardest parts of what we do right now. 
because frankly, we know so much more, but it's very difficult for an engineer in the field to implement this today because it's, it wouldn't, may not be within the code. Uh, hopefully things are changing. Unfortunately, the last nine months failure to have a budget in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has slowed this down tremendously because when that budget impasse started, there were conversations about redoing and everything. So I've been told it's a big effort from your department to do so. So we have our, you know, all those things that Al was mentioning I do. I'm not very good at not volunteering, so I'm sure we'll be involved in that hopefully in the future. And it is now quarter of two. So I'll tell you what, I'll take one more question and then I'll be up here and ask her any questions. Yes? Do you worry about mosquitoes leaving? No. Uh, basically, mosquitoes <laughs> take three or four days to hatch. Then they take several days within a larva. And this is a very common question. Every township supervisor asks these questions. And then it takes another days to go from the larva, so it takes about a week. Most of these sites might be wet for a day or two. Uh, now, the only exception would be the stormwater wetlands. In that case, I would call my good biologist friends to explain about having a good habitat because I'm sure there are mosquitoes there. Kel is turning around there. There should be mosquitoes there, but there's also frogs and dragonflies that are eating the mosquito operation. The only time, we well, have to ask Stephanie if she's ever been bitten by a mosquito out there. <laughs> okay, not really. <laughs> okay, that's good. You know, we've had two reports of mosquitoes at the site. One, it turned out there's a whole pile of empty tires in front next to the window of the person reporting it, and it was water in the tires that sat there that caused it. And the other one is when they're putting the lights in the pathway along the stormwater wetland. They dug a ditch for the cables, and there's a lot of mosquitoes in that ditch when it was open for a couple of days because water was just sitting in there. But in the wetlands itself, there's fish that eat them. There, it's, I've been out there millions of times. I've never even been buzzed by a mosquito in about 15 years of working on that site. So it's a very common misperception. All right, and I said one more. So I'll tell you what, uh, thank you very much. I'll be glad to answer any questions up here. And uh, please cut the cake, Stephanie, whoever brought it.